Hi, it's Faye. I wanted to come on and talk about some changes that I've noticed in the Earth grid lately. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Faye and I'm a spiritual geomancer. And I am fortunate to have this ability to see things that other people can't. So I see geomagnetic forces. I see sort of um, 3D sort of holographic shapes and other things things are filling the air um, and it's sort of beyond our normal sense of reality. So our normal 3D world, I consider to be like a room and I'm able to see outside of that room and sort of all the energetic blueprints and other spaces and dimensions. And I've been able to do that since I was very young. So I work as a spiritual geomancer working with earth energy. Um, and most people are familiar with the Western form of geomancy, which is Feng Shui. But really, geomancy was a worldwide system and its vestiges are still seen in monuments in our landscape and ruins in our sacred places. And we recognise that ancient man had a system of working with naturally occurring earth energy. And it's a system whereby we bring into alignment our activities and our habitats and we bring them into alignment with the forces that animate our world. Um, the life force that brings all things into being. And we um, cultivate that in our secular spaces where we live and work. And then we visit sacred sites where we um, can connect to something more than ourselves, to divinity, to gods, to goddesses. And, and then we bring those epiphanies, the, the, the insight that we receive at these places, at the sacred sites, back into our secular spaces where we live and work and, and act it out accordingly. And those sacred spaces are on sites of significance in the energetic grid of the earth. So there's like a worldwide energy grid. Um, lots of people have studied this from dowsers, geomancers, philosophers. Uh, one of the most recent examples is the Becker Hagen's grid, which was um, created. And it's really sort of the mathematical um, network that would form the sphere of the earth. Um, and that corresponds to, large, to, to a degree to energy lines that um, fit it all together. So it's like a big grid, circular grid network. Um, now, where those grid lines intersect, they form our sacred power, uh, sacred power centers. And there are big lines that circumnavigate the earth. And then there are lesser lines to lesser power centers, lesser lines again to lesser power centers. So it's like, you know, the, the arteries, veins and capillaries of the earth, or it's like major road networks and lesser roads and by roads and country lanes um, and linking, you know, cities, towns, villages, hamlets. Um, and that's how it seemed to sort of more or less how the energy works. And what I've noticed is over the last year, these uh, emperor lines, as some people call them, these big lines that circumnavigate the world, um, they have, they've always had a kind of a, a mirror image, a, a secondary line or a shadow line. And how I see the energy in the world it's a very real energy form um, with particular wave patterns in it. So it's not geomagnetic, but I've also seen next to it, I think of it almost like a negative image, not negative as in not positive, but like the reverse of the the, the energy wave, uh, like a photograph negative. So when we used to take photographs, we had a negative film and it was sort of opposite to what, what it, opposite colours to how it would be printed on um the, the actual photograph paper so we have an energy line it almost like has a negative imprint in the landscape adjacent to it a little bit off and i've been able to see some of these um more or less existing around these big energy lines but i've noticed in the last year they've got more defined and more um visible and clearer and i've also noticed in the last few days really since just before astronomical in bulk, a little bit before that, and now since then, that some of the other lines, the sort of what were sort of secondary class lines, I suppose, have got this negative next to them as well. So it's a little bit off, a little bit to the side, but it's there as well. Um, and then at the same time, the the energy layers themselves have got more energy flowing around and they've, they've increased. Now, I think... I've been thinking about this and I just want to put some thoughts out there for people to, to think about, to muse over my philosophical thinkings, if you like. Um, 
you know, in Feng Shui terms, we've got yang energy, which is concerned with the world of the living, the house of the living. And then we've got yin energy, which is concerned with the house of the dead. I prefer to think of it as the house of other space. So the house of the living, I think of as our three dimensional world, the living, breathing world that we can see. And I think of yin, the house of the dead. It's the energy space beyond our perception of 3D reality. Now, when I actually travel, I wouldn't actually I wouldn't even call it astrally travel because there's no astral body involved. My mind goes into these other places, which is full of geometrical structures. And um, the whole thing is a massive geometrical form, like when we have ayahuasca trips or people take, um, you know, mind altering substances. They go through these long kaleidoscopic experiences. But at the other side of that, there is this sort of this vast space and I mean, like it's like space, but it's full of geometrical energy forms. And it's within that space that the geometrical form um, of all things is, because everything is born of geometry. So the, the, the Earth grid is representative of the energy structure that has to be present for a globe, for a spherical object to come into existence. Same as there is a, a, an energy electrical, electrical, an energy blueprint for a tree, a person. They're all in this space. And I think of as that almost is maybe what was meant by um, originally perhaps by the house of the dead. It's not the dead, it's just the other space, n dimensional space where there are other non-human entities, other consciousnesses, where there is no real you, you're just part of this blended euphoric space. And, you know, that that's where the seed of everything lies. It's, I suppose, in sort of, it's like David Bohm in the quantum physics called it the implicate order. The explicate order is that which we can see, touch, feel here. But the implicant order is this energy that sits behind everything before it comes into form. And I think more or less, I think of yin space as that. And I think that's why we have to have water at sacred sites, because the presence of water, there's something about the energy of water that comes in and out of both the physical dimension and very much the energy dimension as well. So what I've noticed with these energy lines is that increasingly in our yang house of the living, our reality, this negative kind of image, the flip side of that energy that's sitting alongside our, lay, our energy lays, is like the energy almost that you see in this n-dimensional space. And what I think that is, is like we are, it would be interesting to see if other people can see this as well. It's like there is a, a thinning of the wall of certain frequencies of energy a thinning of that wall where we would normally not perceive them. So I'm starting to perceive things in this dimension that I would normally only perceive in that dimension. Now, that might be that that's what's happening for other people, or that might be just something that's unique to me. I don't know that because I would be a fool to say this is what it's like for me, therefore this is what it's like for everybody, because it would take some particular kind of ego to think that my experience with energy is somehow transferable to the whole of the human species. You know, and, and we do see a little bit of that in the spiritual world, you know, oh, the energies are really heavy today, everybody. If so, the energies are heavy for you, not necessarily everybody. Other people who might be having similar experiences because they may have similar energy or similar things going on in their life, but it's certainly not necessarily true for everybody. And I think what I wanted to talk about as well is the nature of this energy in our landscape and how it affects us. So our human aura and our chakra system draw in energy from the landscape. It's not just emanates from our body. We draw it in from outside. And even our chakra system exhibits aura from the landscape. We pull it in and it comes out of these unfolding lotus petal formations that are our, um, our chakra system. And our aura itself, when we go out into the landscape, it kind of unfolds in different layers, different geometrical forms and pulls energy in for the landscape. So this means we are intimately entwined with the landscape where we live and work. And shifts in the energy in the landscape create shifts in us. Now, we seem to be moving into a different level of energy. And I know in the I Ching Feng Shui world, you know, we're, we're moving from the eight dimension earth into nine dimension, nine directions, more of a, um, a fire element in, I suppose, what would be considered what the, the 
the, the mis mysterious void of the hexagons um, in sort of Ai Xing. But we're not going to go into that now. But what we're moving into is the next phase of energy, which everybody often says we're going into higher levels of energy. And, and I think we're seeing that tension in the world around us because we each embody those shifts in our own way, in our own lives. Now, some of us have more ordinary lives where we just exist, we embody this energy and how it plays out impacts on our work, our relationships, our um, world that we exist in, the reality and our um, zone of influence, the people that we can influence. But of course, there are other people who are in positions of power and authority. They are equally subject to this energy. And all of us are being called to shift into this next type of energy, whatever it is, that is being um, symbolized through changes in the earth grid. Now, I can choose as an individual to step up to that change and say, I'm going to look at what needs to evolve in me and I'm going to look at um, how I can contribute to society. And I've decided that I, I don't want to be so, you know, think about me all the time. Although I want to put me to the side at times. I want to contribute to society and not be self-obsessed. Um, and, and that, but that will involve me, you know, looking at myself reflectively and being honest with myself. Other people will be in the state of their personal development where that's too difficult for them. And, you know, it could result in sort of narcissistic tendencies, whereas I don't want to admit there's anything wrong with me deep down. Therefore, I'm going to control what you think and what you do so that I don't have to change. Because if I allow you free reign, that means you're going to challenge me. And I think that's, you know, those everybody will have be faced some kind of challenge along those to those degree. But if we're if people are in positions of power and authority um, in our society and political systems and institutions and social structures, then that challenge that they are feeling as a soul impacts their decisions and their decisions impact all of us. And I think potentially we're seeing that on the world stage where we've got some people wanting to move the world forward. And yet we're fighting also, particularly in the Western world, we're fighting against ideologies that are particularly harmful. We're fighting against, you know, things like lack of freedom of speech and, you know, ideologies like that are being voices upon us, if you like, that we know somewhere along the lines, you know, like, like I said, like freedom of speech or, um, you know, lots of contested theories like critical race theory or queer theory or gender ideology theory. They're all contested theories. They, they've come out of universities. There's no necessarily evidence to say that they're right. Um, and yet debate about these things is being shut down. We've got, you know, is there a climate crisis? Is there not? And, you know, lots of our systems seem to be uh, intent on the moment, on almost like bloody self-destruction. <laughs> and so, and yet many of us are feeling the pull to, there's got to be a better way of living than we currently are. Um, because, you know, this the, the uh, uh, societies, people are struggling, you know, not just this, this I won't say, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff, but also, you know, so many people have got mental and emotional health problems. Our young people are really struggling. Our old people are neglected. You know, we've got big chasms appearing in, in, in our societies. And I'm not saying we should, we can all be one big happy family 100% of the time. That's, you know, probably unrealistic. People will always disagree. But we've we've got this misalignment between ourselves and the natural world, how society sort of progressing. We just, you know, you feel like some of the things we're doing are, not sustainable um, in the long term in how we are living and how we are looking after each other. And I think, you know, so there'll be people who have a vested interest or people who want to progress things and have open debate about what's the best way forward. And, you know, is capital is on the brink of collapse. Have we got another system to replace it? Because if communism didn't work and if capitalism was about to fall, then we need some good thinkers up there thinking about what the next thing could possibly be rather than trying to get us to eat locusts and have lots of vaccinations for instance so there's all these sort of different um ways of control that are still prevalent and of course the more the energy is trying to push us into a new way of being the more those people 
who individually really for whatever reason don't want that shift will the more control they will feel the need to exercise over everybody to prevent that shift from happening of course he's not going to prevent it what the shift the change will occur as just as spring follows winter the change will occur the difficulty is how do we traverse those challenges how do we navigate our way through this change and i think this tension the shift in energies that we're seeing in the earth grid could potentially be one of the factors in this tension that um sort of sense of foreboding that a lot of people feel in their lives particularly in the western world at the moment um and i just wonder whether that's something that people have thought about you know the earth energy isn't just some abstract thing you know when we work concisely with earth energy it, it's about you know making sure our, not just you know when we, we talk about feng shui you know and geomancy is always you know aligning buildings you know to the to the right you know alignments yeah yes it is but that has a profound impact you know and it's also about making sure that the plants we grow grow you know well and healthy but it's making sure people are well and healthy it's making sure our activities are done to the best advantage and can give them the greatest chance for success not just for individual satisfaction but the, for the safety security and longevity of societies so we want to make sure that we have places where people can live and work and do their stuff what they're good at but also have sacred spaces where we can uncover our true potential. And we use earth energies to do that. So working with earth energy is both a spiritual experience, as in when we create sacred spaces and utilize that earth energy, they have the potential and they do create altered states of consciousness. So those are our sacred spaces. But we can also use earth energy very practically to make sure that we get greater crop production for less input of agrochemicals and less use of water. So there's both a spiritual and a practical level. And I think these shifts in energies are an opportunity for us to explore how very differently we could be living. But we have an old regime that was hooked into capitalism and the people invested in that system are the ones that have control over us. And on some maybe deep and spiritual level, they're feeling the tension between everything they've invested in and what the energy wants them to become. And the, the disparity between the two means that they are more likely to cling on and try and exert more control over people. So it's more important ever that we embody these changes in our individual lives to speak about what we know to be true, about how we want to live, to not fall prey to ideologies that are twisting us away from what is real and what is right. And we have to grant people the freedom to, to have difficult conversations and that it's OK to be disagreement. You know, disagreement is not trying to cancel you. Disagreement. Is, we have a very, um, really a very weak society in many respects that cannot cope with disagreement and cannot cope with, you know, lots of things. And it, it's a very, um, you know, we, nobody wants to see the collapse of the West um because that would be um you know a very difficult world if that happened actually so that's really what i wanted to say i wanted to come on and talk about there is a there is a, a definite i perceive there to be a definite link between the state and nature of earth energies and our expressions of ourselves as an individual our soul expression but also how we express ourselves as societies and when there is tension between shifts in what the energy is becoming and the vested interest people have in keeping the, the current energy they have had that's made life good for them um, or whatever, it's not quite that simple. But then people who don't want to move with this new um, level of energy, they will try and stay where they are. And for some people in who have, you know, ordinary positions in life that would just mean them getting stuck in stuck in the mire in their own lives but for people who hold positions in society of power and authority they will try i believe and exert control um you know stopping people you can't fly you can't eat meat you can't say that 
you can't do this. It's an effort to keep people um, from actually living and moving into these changes because they don't want it to happen. And, you know, they can justify that with climate change and this, that and the other excuses. But ultimately, there has to be some deep personal um, perceptions about what the world should be that come from them inside that they want to see manifest in the world. I'd love your thoughts on this because I perceive that earth energy has got an awful lot to do actually with how our society structures and organizes itself. And when we're in tune it, with it and we embrace the changes that it's bringing, I think potentially we could have um, very different societies. Um, I'm not saying, you know, everything would be hunky-dory and perfect because we obviously had it in the past, but for whatever reason, you know, who knows, younger Dryas and, you know, um, maybe famines and various things, that kind of system has, um, you know, got, got, we lost it over time, who knows? But I think it'd be interesting to have a conversation about it. I think it'd be interesting to explore it. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. These sort of philosophical musings. And, uh, you know, you don't have to agree with what I say. And I don't have to agree with you either. You know, and that's perfectly okay.